Grace, mercy, and peace from God the Father and from Jesus Christ, the Father's Son, who will be with us in truth and love. The Word of God for our sermon is from John chapter 3 this morning, from our reading, our gospel, particularly the first eight verses. Dear friends in Christ, this past Thursday, I got to go to the Air Force Academy graduation. I've not had opportunity before, and it was better than I have heard described or imagined. The ceremony, the formality, the patriotism was phenomenal. The Flying Thunderbirds show afterwards, unbelievable. Like many things that I have observed in life that are very complex, I, I cannot comprehend I cannot comprehend how those jets could do what they were doing with such precision and timing. How in the world do you do those things with jets going over 500 miles an hour? How can you fly upside down and know where you're going and and not hit the oncoming jet that is, is heading right towards you? I sat next to Terry Rotering, so I was able to ask him some questions, and he was able to answer some of them, but again, that is just beyond my comprehension. You want to talk about something complex beyond all of our comprehension, then we can talk about the work of the Holy Trinity. The, the, the bad analogy just shows you that it's indescribable, it's incomprehensible, How God is one, yet God is three. How the Trinity is in unity. How we have God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit, yet we only have one God, even though we talk about the work of all three. So let's try to keep it simple. Let's stick with the facts. And the fact is that Scripture teaches us that the Holy Trinity works for our good. Now, present good and eternal good. And that this important work, something that Jesus and Nicodemus talk about in John chapter 3, this important and wonderful work is something that we need to treasure, something that is eternally important, even if there's a whole jet stream of confusion and incomprehensibility around it. So there was a man named Nicodemus, we're told, that was a Pharisee, a member of the Sanhedrin, and he came to Jesus secretly at night and called him rabbi and entered into some discussions with him. Sticking with the facts, Nicodemus was a Pharisee, and we know that Pharisees were not Jesus' favorite people. That's because they always wanted to follow protocol and man-made rules when it came to religion And Jesus was always only about mercy, not sacrifice. Fact number two, Nicodemus was a Pharisee who was a member of the Sanhedrin. And the Sanhedrin, the Jewish ruling council, was that group of 72 insta-judges who condemned Jesus and sentenced him to death. And then fact number three. I wonder if Nicodemus was maybe a part of a silent majority in that group. Very silent, very minority that disagreed with the Sanhedrin's judgment against Jesus and actually believed in him. And that's maybe not a fact, that's maybe a guess, but let's put some facts together. And one is he came to Jesus at night, secretly, courageously, And maybe that was just the custom. Maybe they were just getting into a deep conversation at night and didn't have time to do that during the day. But, you know, there was another secret member of that Sanhedrin, Joseph of Arimathea. Remember him, the the rich man that donated his grave so that Jesus could receive a proper burial? We're told in the Gospel of Luke that Joseph and Nicodemus were the two that buried Jesus' body there. So at the very least, Nicodemus, though he was a part of this world of hatred and envy and jealousy of Jesus, 
uh, part of a group that named Jesus a Messiah wannabe, a blasphemer, worthy and guilty of death? At the very least, he had some questions for Jesus, wondering if maybe he might indeed be the true Son of God. Have you heard of a group of people nowadays that call themselves or are referred to as the religious nuns? Not nuns like Mother Mary or Sister Catherine. Nuns, N-O-N-E-S. When they fill out a survey and are asked what their religious preference are, their answer is none. This group used to be about 5%, and that was in the 1970s, you know, in the hippie years, and now in the more enlightened years, it's up to 20%. Of those 20%, I'm sure some of them are out-and-out atheists, and that's a growing number, but there's probably a lot of people in that group that simply have questions. Like Nicodemus. I don't know if I prefer to be called a Jewish Pharisee and member of the Sanhedrin, if that is my religious preference, or I don't know if I want to be a follower of Christ. Right now, I don't have any religious preference. People like that have questions, and we have the privilege of dealing with those people and and talking to them. Jesus' conversation went quickly to what he knew Nicodemus needed to hear, and that is that you can't be a part of the kingdom of God unless you're born again, unless you're born of water and the Spirit. No, that would have been a shocker for Nicodemus because he was raised believing that you were a part of the kingdom of God by birth, by being a part of the right race, by your religious and obedient prowess. But Jesus said, "Uh uh-uh, we're all born sinful. We're all born with a stone-cold heart that is opposed to God, and we all need to be reborn We need to be baptized. We need the work of the Holy Spirit. And then we can believe. And belief is the dividing line between being in and out of the kingdom of God. We are familiar with John 3.16, right? In fact, let's say it together. It's the most famous or most well-known passage of the Bible And Jesus speaks it here in this context. Let's say it together. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only Son that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life. And Jesus points out in that passage that it is belief. That's the important thing. Now later I'm going to talk a little bit on this job fair Sunday about service in the kingdom but it's important for us to know that jesus doesn't say that whoever serves is a part of the kingdom of god and will have eternal life service in the church good works in our community and in our homes very important we'll talk about that but it doesn't put you in or out There is no way that you can buy your way into the kingdom of God, not through money, not through quantity of works, not through quality of worship and prayers. The work of the Holy Spirit is what puts us in the kingdom of God, causing us to believe. Jesus says here, yes, sinful flesh gives birth to sinful flesh, but also the Spirit gives birth to the Spirit. And here's how it all works together. God the Father surrendered His Son and gave Him up as the ultimate sacrifice and the ultimate act of selfless love. You and I wouldn't do that. We wouldn't give up our children for anything, much less for the whole world. Jesus, God the Father, did that with His Son. And then God the Son actively obeyed God's law for us. We couldn't do that, even if we wanted to be perfect. We certainly are sinful. God the Son's sinless life was sacrificed on the cross to pay for our sins, and God the Holy Spirit is the one who has caused our stone-cold hearts to believe it, to receive it, to make it our own, so that we can have the benefits 
of being a part of the kingdom of God presently and forever in the future. And I cannot begin to explain how all that is or, or why. I mean, who can understand the mind of God to be able to take a look at the plan he came up with for us, poor, miserable sinners? Who, who can understand the, the mind of God that would send his son to, to do this work? I don't know how it is that the Holy Spirit works in baptism, I'm just told that he works miracles in a little baby's heart. I also don't understand how, how a cute, cuddly baby can be an unbeliever and full of sin. It doesn't make any sense to me. I don't understand how someone who is baptized and raised in a believing family can fall away from the true saving faith. I can't understand how someone later in life that never was raised with religion all of a sudden is interested in it. You would think, wouldn't you, that someone, that anyone that is introduced through baptism and, and through the Holy Spirit's work of faith into this amazing religion of love and sacrifice where we don't do anything but receive it, you would think that that would be something no one would fall away from. And you would think that somebody that works hard at running away from Jesus wouldn't deserve a second chance or a third or a fourth or a fifth chance. I understand astrophysics better than I understand how all this works. So let's just stick with what we do know. God loves us. The, the holy, triune, perfect, mighty God loves us. And the triune God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit all work together to make sure that we know He loves us and that we always love Him. So with that in mind, is it fair to ask, now that we've got and know the Holy Spirit, the Holy Trinity working for us, is it fair to ask if it's all right to ask of us to work a little bit for Him? Now, the job fair and the service committees, that's one way to do it, and it's something we're emphasizing today. I'll have an announcement about that later. And that's an important way because it's the life, the work of the church, and all of us have gifts that we can use towards it. But, you know, another way is good parenting, raising the next generation to understand how important of a priority it is to know and learn and worship God and how important it is to glorify Him, not by a sense of entitlement, but by a sense of hard work. And so is working on your marriage. You know, men cannot comprehend why it takes women so long to make a decision and, and such a short time to reverse that decision. And women can't understand why men just sit at home and stare at a screen. But it's going to take a little work for us to figure that out. A worthwhile work of working on your marriage so it's everything God intended it to be. And, and so is using your gifts at home and, and in your career and at school. And so is being a helpful neighbor. That is doing work for the Holy Trinity and so is being a trusted employee. All of that is just us doing work, works of love, works of service for someone who worked and loved and served us so well. There were a couple of other thoughts I had while I was watching the Flying Thunderbirds. One is, all that difficult work is really meant for two reasons. One, I'm sure, so that those pilots can, can fly in dangerous situations in, in battle and, and not lose their heads or, or their cool and know exactly how to maneuver in tough, tight spots. And of course, the other reason is so that they can entertain us down below. But then I also was thinking... If you knew how to do that kind of stuff, and the government gave you million-dollar jets and unlimited amount of fuel, wouldn't it be fun to be able to cruise around and, and do all those kinds of stunts and maneuvers? The work of the Holy Trinity is also difficult, but I imagine enjoyable. Enjoyable for God the Father to author our salvation and then see it carried out. Enjoyable for God the Son to... Uh, Know that he can ascend back into heaven, job complete, sit at the right hand of God, 
and then enjoyable for God the Holy Spirit to bring people to faith, enjoyable for God the Holy Trinity to to watch His people believe in Him and, and worship Him. And I imagine that it's enjoyable for God, the Holy Trinity, to see those people down here on earth who know that His work was for them, saying, here am I, send me.